Good morning, everyone. My name is Angelo. All right. My name is Xiaoran Wang. And uh, we are here to tell you everything about browsers gone wild today. Okay. All right. Uh, so a little bit about ourselves. Uh, for me, uh, I work for Salesforce. I'm a senior product security engineer. And uh, I do security research. And my main security uh, research interests are uh, web application security, program analysis, automation, and browser exploitations, et cetera. And I presented a few conferences before, for example, Black Hat USA, Turcon, HackerHotic, et cetera. It's my first time in Black Hat Asia, so I'm pretty excited. And so a little bit about this talk. So we're going to talk about a few browser specific weaknesses. So uh, for example, we're going to talk about some future bypass, some data URI malware distribution, something like that. And uh, none of those are zero day vulnerabilities, <laughs> but the goal of the talk is to figure out what are the things that a attacker can do to leverage new browser features to abuse users and to deceive users. So without further ado, let me pass to Angelo. All right. So, um, uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is, um, you know, quite of a, uh, announcement, which is Unicode 7 point A, breaking news, introduced 250 new emojis. What that means for you is, you know, you can have a chicken emoji, which is represented as 1F414. Uh, you know, there's the dog, there's the pig, you know, there's, there's a rat. So there's all these funky looking characters that are nothing but Unicode pairs. Um, on the iPhone, they look a little bit better. They look like that, right? Uh, now you might be thinking, why didn't we do cat emojis? Well, I don't know. I think emojis should be made out of cats. That's the, you know, that's really the future as we see it. Uh, so let's look a little bit more in, in the technology behind emojis. Um, but before that, a step back and, and let's talk about Punicode. So Punicode is a, it's an encoding syntax. It's a way that you can, um, you can use a UTF-8, uh, a string of characters to translate it into ASCII so that it can be used for DNS uh, and it's just used for internationalized domain names like Chinese domain names, for example, Korean, Japanese, in general CKJ characters. Um, well, the problem with that is there's going to be characters like forward slash um, that have Unicode, um, <coughs> that have similar Unicode uh, representations. Uh, for example, Unicode point 2044 is the fraction slash, which is used for math operations, but it's not the forward slash. Um, but it looks a heck of a lot like it. Um, you know, it has a bit of an inclination, but it looks very similar. So it, it is really hard to distinguish these characters. And depending on the font, it might actually be impossible. Um, and you know, there's a website that you can you can look up all the all the different characters that are similar. Uh, but I'll give you an example. Um, so if you're looking at this URLs over here, right? So this, um, you know, th this um, this case, uh, you can see that the domain here is bad.com. So what's happening is this dot is not a real dot; it's a Unicode dot, right? Uh, in this case, for example, the question mark, uh, it will be a Unicode representation of a question mark, but it's not the actual question mark. So the domain that would actually load, you know, it, it would be over here, right? So you can see there's, there's a number of ways you can fool the user by having uh, Punicode. But luckily, browsers um, will protect against it in, in a way. So let me first show you what happened with email clients. Uh, with email clients, you can see here there's my email, um, angelo.prado.salesforce.com, if you copy this to Notepad uh, and you search for Salesforce, you see, we'll actually find it. Uh, and the reason is this is not a real A. So if we search for force, it will find it. But if you search for sales, it won't find it. And the reason is this is not the real A. Like I said, this is a, um, this is a Greek A. Let me see if we can, we can Google it. The internet's a little bit slow today, so bear with us. You can see it's, it's a Russian A. It's a Cyrillic A. So it's not a real Latin Roman letter A. Therefore, you know, it looks like an A, but it's not an A. If you, in fact, if I search for A, you know, this is the last A that it will, the notepad will find. Uh, but unfortunately, on iOS devices, when you visualize on an email, you know, it will, it will look just like an A uh, because the font representation is the same. Uh, so it's a very easy way to do some phishing attack, right? Uh, now, with URLs, it works a little bit different. Um, this is Salesforce, again, with this funky looking A. And what Punicode is going to do is going to expand it to a different encoding. So when you click it, 
um, this is what actually happens. Uh, it will open that funky looking domain name, which is no longer, you know, it's no longer easy to use for a phishing attack, right? Now, the problem is there will be other characters that are not expanded into punicode. Uh, they're actually shown just like that. So, for example, um, this forward slash is like a Japanese katana, and it looks a lot like a forward slash. Uh, you know, there's other forward slashes that look like a smiley faces, or a forward slash having a bad day, right, because it's bent. Um, but you know, it, it, it does look pretty credible. Uh, maybe, maybe not, depending on the user. Uh, but you know, you can get the idea. Like in this case, um, for example, the domain is not paypal.com. This is all the subdomain. It's a Unicode subdomain. So the actual domain, it's evilhacker.com, right? Uh, so the URL that you would be loading, in this case would be, this is the URL that the browser is loading behind the scenes, which is paypal.xn, con login, blah, 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 evilhacker.com. But this is what the user will see, right? And if you make it, if you make the subdomain long enough, you know, you can actually hide the domain behind the overflow. So what you will see is that you think you're in google.com, but you're not. You're, you're in a domain that I control, you're in an evil domain, so I can serve any phishing attack that I want. Um, so you just need to make the subdomain lo long enough so it will overflow the address bar. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty standard. Uh, and let, let's talk a little bit about the design philosophies. You know, what we see is, um, you know, Google thinks, okay, well, the only reliable security indicator in a browser is the URL bar. You know, whereas Apple, Apple is always looking for simplicity. Apple is always looking for, um, you know, bring calm and simplicity so you're not really aware of the solution. So you're not really aware of what's happening behind the scenes, right? Um, so let's talk about, let's see how that look plays in, in the Apple ecosystem. Let's talk about emojis. What if, you know, what if HTTP had emoji support? It doesn't have it in Chrome. It doesn't have it in Internet Explorer. But, you know, iOS is, the number one device in, in the United States. Um, Safari is the number one mobile browser. And it turns out it actually supports emoji. So you can have google.com with emoji or you know, two giant red O's. Now, you might be thinking, well, Angelo, that does not look very credible. You know, that looks like a phishing attack. How many of you would fall for this? Probably not many, right? Okay. Now, what if, what if we make it more credible? What if we put paypal.com with a lock? Ah, now it suddenly starts looking more credible. What if office.com with a document icon, right? Or box.com with a folder? Is, would anybody fall for these domains? So that's more, you know, that's more like it, right? Um, you can have facebook.com with an emoji here with a checkbox, uh, apple.com with a square, uh, facebook.com with an empty square. So you get the idea, right? Um, so, you know, you can actually have, um, you know, Microsoft.com or Salesforce.com with a checkbox. You know, so it's like a checkbox, right? It's like secure, this is, this is safe. And, and it's nothing, you know, the domain, you're actually loading behind the scene. This is what you're loading behind the scenes. So, uh, but Safari, you know, the, 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 the funny thing here, Safari will render the emojis in the URL, and that's, that's beautiful. Um, so we actually now, if you use your browser and you find the search, you know, the search emoji and you type google.tk, I actually own that domain. So you can go to google.tk and I, I own that domain. And, you know, it's just basically, it has the search emoji, so it's not really Google. Um, but, you know, you get the idea. Um, so our next investment that we are investing on is going to be Poopla, which is basically animated emojis in the URL bar. Um, and that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and it actually is a domain. If you search for Poopla, it actually exists. And if you have an iPhone, you will see it just like this. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about something more technical. Let's talk about um, we found an issue on iOS 7 and the first versions of iOS 8 um, that enables you to spoof the URL. Um, and Apple recently fixed it. Uh, there's an advisory, and I wanted to show you a video of how that works. Um, if the video loads, uh, let's see. Um, all right, uh, kind of loading. Um, well, maybe I'll have to show it later, because the internet is a little bit slow. Let's see, how do we make this higher quality? You don't think it's gonna load? It's gonna kill it, oh man. I don't have this one offline, so, um, oh no, it actually loads, okay, it's, it's loading. 
Uh, we're going to make it a screen. So, so here's the, here, I'll walk you through what is loading. Uh, the connection is painfully slow. I have no idea why. Um, but there's a hyperlink on an email, right? And it says it's going to PayPal.com. It's actually not going to PayPal.com. The target of the hyperlink is going to an evil page, okay? Um, but it says it's PayPal.com. Now, I'm going to play it, see how far it goes. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, okay. Well, we'll then we'll come back to it in, in a bit. We'll come back to this this demo in a second. Um, let's talk about browser. I'll show you guys in one minute. Let's talk about browser XSS filters while the demo loads. Um, so browser XSS filters are very important because they protect against cross-site scripting attacks, right? Um, how many of you guys are familiar with cross-site scripting attacks? Can I see some hands? Okay, so fa fairly an amount, large amount of people. Uh, so it's basically the ability to inject a malicious script on a web page. Um, you know, the problem with XSS filters is they're not that strong. They will not protect you against persistent XSS or DOM-based XSS. Uh, and, and the thing is, there's a few tricks that I'm going to show you that you can use to evade this um, XSS filters. So let me, let me show you a few examples. So in Chrome, for example, right, let's say you have something like this, right? Let me, let me make the font a little bit bigger. Um, right, so let's say you have um, bypass, you, ha you try to inject in a script in a URL, right? So let me open it in Chrome and Oh, this is almost loaded, see? Great, so we have a script, and if you look at the source code, you see Chrome says, oh, well, that's not gonna fly, it contains a reflected XSS, XSS vector, so Chrome will protect against executing this script, it will not execute, right? Now, what if, what if instead of that, we put something with, um, you know, CSS, like bold tags, will that actually execute? So you can execute things, you can make it underline, so long it's not a JavaScript. So that's beautiful. Uh, let's do some bypasses. So let me show you the first one um, over here. So the first one that executes is basically um, what we're going to inject is a single quote and then an alert. Now, Chrome will not protect you against injections um, that have that happen to exist within a string literal. So it will only protect you if there's angle brackets, if you have a single quote and then some sort of a alert and then you do plus and then the single quote, that's all the payload is doing here. This will execute, Chrome will not detect it uh, because you were read in JavaScript context, so that's beautiful. Now uh, there's other ways which is you could open a script and not close it, let me show you. And that actually runs, that's beautiful. So you know, all we did is we injected this line over here, right? script alert, and then, and that said, that's our injection point. Because we did not close the script, Chrome did not detect it as a cross-site scripting. However, how does this actually work? Well, basically, it executes the first line, then the second line says, I don't know what this is, I don't know what this is, this is invalid syntax, right? And then eventually, it will find a closed script because there will be another script on the page. And that actually does work. In fact, if you look at the developer toolbars and you look at the console, it says BR is not defined. Um, but you know, the first, the first alert, you know, or malicious payload, it executed. Um, BR is not defined because, well, guess what? BR is not a JavaScript function. Um, but it, it actually does work. So, so it's beautiful. Uh, another one is you can use an HTML uh, import. So let me show you that. Um, one second. So the payload is basically very simple. The payload is link rel import href xss and it says xss evil hacker.com and you might be thinking what is this black magic? Again, just like before, we don't actually close the element because otherwise it will trigger the filter. We let the page to eventually close the element. It will close it with this angle bracket right here. All right. You say what is this black magic, this import? Well, this xss is actually importing a third party element that will render on this page. So if we open this xss, evilhacker.com forward slash xss has html that's being imported into the page and it's running on the main context of the page. Uh, so that's how we bypass the filter. Uh, and there's a few more, um, you know, I won't keep you here all day, but SBG, um, you can inject an SBG, which is a vectors graphic with an onload, as you can see here, I'm sorry, with an onclick, JavaScript on click. So when you click it, it will, uh, it will also execute. Um, now you might be thinking, uh, well, but this is very obvious because you can see malicious things on the URL. Uh, it's actually not that simple. Um, there's a way to bypass the URL limitations, which is you just use a very long link. So let's look at this link over here. 
You see, it's a really long link. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's a really, really, really long link. Okay, it's really long. Uh, if you click it, because Chrome thinks it's very long, you see the exercise is still executed, but Chrome dropped the whole URL. It just decided, you know what? This is a very long, complicated page. I'm just going to, you know, not have a path. I'm just going to drop the whole path altogether. Why not? You might be thinking, is this for real? Yeah, watch this. This is, this is for real. If you do lo document location href, here you can see this is the actual URL where we are. Right? So this is the actual URL where we are. But, you know, Chrome decides that for, for user purposes, you know, they're going to drop the URL. So, uh, so that's beautiful. Um, now let's talk about Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer has some issues as well. Um, fundamentally, if you try to inject something, you will see this message. Internet Explorer has modified a page to prevent cross-site scripting. Um, what I tried to inject here is a single quote and says alert false. So that didn't quite work, right? Um, and you can see it replaced it with the hash sign. But if we, if we try the following, let's try this right now. Right. So we try x equals one, single quote, comma, x equals alert, comma. So we're trying to override the method. We're trying to override x to call our function, right, malicious function. And that doesn't work either because uh, Internet Explorer is running on the latest mode, which does not allow you to override functions. Now, if you were to run this on compatibility mode, um, like Internet Explorer 6 um, or 7, um, it will execute, but that's hacking it, right? That's a trick. Uh, but what you can do is you can, you can iframe your target page from evil hacker website, and then it will run. And the reason it will run, so here you have it, is you basically iframe your payload, and you can downgrade the security of that iframe. How do you do that? Well, you put a meta tag, you can just put a meta tag on the page that says, UA, user agent compatible in an explorer emulate i7, so evil hacker can force third party domain like malbot.net to load in compatibility mode. Um, and it will load with compatibility settings. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool and you can take advantage of XSS tricks and payloads that didn't work in the past. Um, all right, so that's everything we have with XSS. Let's go back to, um, let's go back to the video I wanted to show you real quick. Okay, here it is. So, so what happens here is you're gonna click in paypal.com and it's going to be really quickly, but you see right here, it looks like it opened PayPal.com, and it's going to give you an error. It's going to say, cannot verify the server identity. So it's going to give you an error. You're going to hit OK and say, OK, something failed, but you know, the domain still looks like sandbox.paypal.com. You're going to hit login. You're going to type your password. And again, this, is, this was running on iOS 8, uh, the first build that came out. You hit login, and you can see right here, you know, you have been hacked. So it's actually not running from PayPal.com. It's running from Malbot, from Malbot.net, Malbot which is my malicious domain. Um, and, if, and basically, if I hit OK, it's going to redirect me to a, to a non-existent page on Malbot.net, as you will see. Um, asking me if I want to save the password. So, so the way this works is... What happened is iOS 7, so the link was actually going to malbot.net, uh, the link. When you click it, it's really hard to see unless you like do um, maybe like a, a slow motion. I don't know if that's even possible here. Um, so anyways, um, there was a way to put it in slow motion. Um, but basically, before you go into paypal.com, you would have to like see it on a, on a frame real quick. It's going, to, um, it's going to malbot. Let's see if we can see it here. Okay, so before, just before going, it's, it's really hard to see because it's just literally one frame. But before going to um, PayPal.com, it's going to Malbot. And Malbot is doing a redirect to sandbox.paypal.com, right? Now, the problem is sandbox.paypal.com is a domain that we use, we scanned using Google search. And it's a domain that has an invalid certificate. Um, and then when the iPhone is configured to use uh, any sort of MDM, mobile device management profile, it will, it will just reject to load any domain that is insecure. Now, the problem with that is it will give you an error, and after you dismiss the error, it would actually leave the URL you know, of the third-party domain on the address bar. The URL where you try to do a JavaScript redirect, it will be fixated in the address bar. Um, 
So that's that's the problem, and then that's why you know at the end of the day when you when you type your login, you know it looks like you're in PayPal, but that's a that's a bug. It's a browser bug. You're not in PayPal. The content is being served from mobile.net, um, and when you type login, it will basically it will basically intercept your password. So um, so that's that's that demo. Um, and now we're going to pass it off to Sharon to talk about Go Smile War. Go Smile War. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about a few topics. It's also trying to use different uh, HTML5 and browser features in order to deceive user into thinking he's doing something, but he's not. So let's go from the first one. And the first one we're trying to look at is using data URI and the HTML feature to deliver malware that's hosted nowhere on the internet. So the building block, first of all, is data URI. And it's a very simple URI scheme. I think probably a lot of you already know it. It's basically you can put actual content into the URLs, URI itself. So for example, you want to embed an image into your site. Uh, instead of loading the image directly using a, say HTTP request, you can save a round trip time by just tr trying to put the uh, uh, source equal to the data URI with image inside of it. You can see basically the image here is the content of the image and before that it was the content type of the uh, data URI. So it's not straightforward, it's just like a feature that people would leverage but is there any way that we can use the feature that is the advantage to attackers? And yes. So to start with, since you can, you can control the content type. So you can not only put images and you can start putting other random stuff. For example, you can start putting say an HTML page onto the whole URI and it would just look like the original page but you're not on the domain that's hosted there. So let's just take a look at it. Okay. So let me zoom it up. All right. So now you're, uh, I'm about to click on a link that's pointing to a data URI. So if you take a look at the bottom half of the screen, you can see, well you probably can't see, but it's pointing to a data URI has a content type of text HTML and then once I click on it, you can see the whole URL is actually a data URI and this is not actually a Facebook login page. So if I test test and password and click on login, it's going to show you the uh, username and password and because it's not under Facebook and your credentials is compromised. So it's just a very simple demo but there is a problem. For example, see when you're on the page, right, you can see all of the uh, crap on through the URL. It's like it's just so many garbage on there. And it's going to definitely alert user into, uh, seeing what is this? Is, am I on Facebook or something like that? So in order to tackle the problem, say, um, you can use the same scheme that Angela talked about. If we feed the URL to be so large that it just can't fit into a single URL bar, for example, Chrome is not going to render it at all. If we click on this, it's still going to go to the fishing page, but it's only going to show you data. So it's not an official domain like facebooklogin.com or myfacebook.com trying to fish you. It's just something like data so innocent that I doubt some anybody would think it's actually illegitimate, it's probably going to be think it's like illegitimate browser um, tweaks or something like that that Facebook leveraged and used for login. So um, just a simple trick you can do to, um, to abuse users. So that's the simplest example we can do. And you can do a whole HTML page into the data URI. But what else? We're, we do not want to stop just inputting HTMLs there. We want to do more advanced, for example, you want to put malwares. You want to put mal mal malwares onto the user's box so you can, you can get persistence, you can get actual compromise. So you can put an entire executable into the, into the data URI. I couldn't believe it in the first place when I, when I was seeing it but it actually worked. The only, the, the, the way to do it is basically just change the content type to be say application slash uh, octet stream or application mxml download and, and then base64 encode your uh, exe into the URL 
and just reload it. And the advantage of this is that there's no server hosting this malware. The entire content is in the URL. And enterprise say if you want to block something you can because there's server to block. And to give you a demo, uh, let's go back to the VM. So this is the gigantic URL that I was talking about. And if you click on enter, it's going to download. And this file is basically the executable just downloaded. So it sounds fun, but there is a serious problem. So if you take a look at the file we just downloaded, it's called download, and there's no file extension. So if I click on it, it's going to say unknown file type, and I have to change a file to be .exe and then run it. So in order to fish the user, you have to persuade the user to click on a link and then change the file extension to something .exe and execute it. I think it might be easier just as a user to kill himself than just doing the whole series of tricks. So that's definitely not going to work. I don't believe that. So how can we solve that problem, right? There is a HTML5 feature. So browsers are so rich in features and there's so many things that we can do research on and I just came across this thing just one day I was doing research and then you can actually put an attribute called download to any A tag or area tag and you can specify the file name with extension in the download attribute and when the browser interpret that download and when the user click on the link that thing in the download is actually going to be the file name and extension of the file and it's supported in Chrome, IE and it's Firefox, basically all major browsers. So how does it work? If you have HTML, if you have an attack, uh, and you have href pointing to a data URI, you only have to specify the download to be say malicious.exe or something actually innocent. And when user clicks on that, it's gonna trigger the download and we control the file name. So, but user needs a click now and users are lazy. So let's just do that for them. Very easy, you can just grab anything on the internet to do out of clicking and I just use a jQuery. And the final page some, looks something like this. So you just have a tag and when you go to the page, it's going to automatically be clicked and the malware is going to be automatically downloaded. So now it's all fun and we have a malware hosted some, not hosting anywhere, but now we have a page. So where do we host this page? It's kind of defeat the whole purpose because I wanted to do something that's hosted nowhere. And when user goes there, it's going to trigger the download and be pwned. So how do we host this page or how do we bypass the problem? We use the same trick. We do the data URI trick again. So we basically turn the page into big 64 encoded content and assign it to a data URI with text HTML. So when user click on this link, it's going to do the whole dance of auto clicking, auto downloading while we can show the file name. So how can you weaponize and use it, right? Say, for example, if you're going to go to online forum, online site that allows you to post content and anything like that. So as long as there's no sanitization of say what the protocol of the file that allows you to post and they don't sanitize it to only be HTTP or HTTPS, you can just post a gigantic thing in there and when user clicks on that, they're going to have a malware installed on their box. So there is one small problem. For example, I still have a Windows XP machine somewhere in VM and it has a pretty small clipboard and it didn't work. Especially if you have a pretty large malware, it's gonna not going to fit in there. It's probably going to trigger a buffer overflow and compromise the machine directly. But you can do something else. You can do a URL shortening and all you need is basically now a tiny URL with something you can remember and you can just bring it with you and it's your weapon you can drop it anywhere you want. So how does it work or what does it look like? So look at this page. It's basically the same page I was mentioning, tinyurl.com Adobe Player Updater. So if I click enter, it's going to download the file when internet works. Wow. It's the best time to um, stop the internet connection just before I click on the uh, download. Okay, so we'll go back to it when we finish downloading. Yeah, the internet is now working too well to here. So, there are two pieces of 
puzzles that browser have to support in order to um, deceive the user in this case. So they both have to support the download attribute and also support redirection from a regular URL to a data URL. But fortunately, as you can see, the two main browsers, uh, Chrome and IE, supports the two features. And we can easily trigger user to be uh, vulnerable when they're using those two browsers. Not saying those two browsers are vulnerable in the first place, but they're just vulnerable to this specific kind of attack. So, how do we recommend to people and browser vendors, right? So, I would start by asking Firefox and Chrome to disallow redirection from regular URL to data URL. I don't see there's any legitimate reasoning uh, to do that. Um, and also, users don't click on anything and don't trust. It's kind of a moot point, but you'll be surprised. So, before we go into the second topic I want to talk about, let's see if the thing's being downloaded. And it is. So, let's keep the executable. And if you click on that, it's basically not going to update your Adobe file, but doing something else. So, you can see the concept. Basically, you have executable on your file system, which we control completely the file name. It's called Adobe Flash Updater. And this file, this malware, is hosted nowhere. So, enterprise out of luck, you're out of luck, there's nowhere to block that. So let's go back to the second topic. So in the, in, in the, in the first topic, we use some HTML5 feature to, to, to treat user and abuse their conceptions. Now let's do something even more fun. So before I get started, uh, anybody or anyone knows about say HTML5 drag and drop? when you can drag a file and drag some elements and drop it on the other part of the page. So it's basically a, a really simple HTML feature, HTML5 feature that you can interact with element on the page by rearranging where they are and do, do, do copy, pasting, something like that. So also there's some uh, interesting usage where you can actually drag a file from your file system into your browser say when you try to upload an attachment in Gmail or you want to upload something to your Google Drive, you can just drag a file directly from your file system and drop it to your browser. So it's a pretty interesting feature and useful. I use it a lot. There's one twig to it. There's a very rare, rarely known feature that's called drag out where you can actually drag a file from your browser out to your file system. So that was interesting because when I came across it, this was one time I was using Chrome browser and it asked me to basically to dra drag and drop the attachment to download it to my file system. I can just drag it out and drop it to my file system and the download finishes. It's like, uh, how does it work? And can I just drag anything out? So it turns out it's not an RFC. And it's only one browser supported, it's Chrome. And after that, I smelled exploit. So how secure the browser feature is? First of all, it works by people, uh, by JavaScript to attach a drag start listener, uh, a listener to a drag start event. And when the drag started, you can set the actual data to be transferred. And the data you can set contains the file name, the content type, and where you want to download the file. So basically everything can be done dynamically and the user should, don't have to be aware of what they're downloading from. So how can we use this feature to take advantage of users? So let's hide it in some other content users are actually trying to download. Say if users are trying to download the image, it sees the image, it tries to drag it out to your file system. So during the process when it's to drag, trying to drag it out, we actually change the image to still be something else, to be say a malware. So when a user downloaded it, it thinks it downloaded the image, but instead it downloaded the executable. So let's take a look at the uh, example uh, in the VM. So, okay, let's close this. Sorry about the resolution, let me just make it larger. So everybody loves CAT. I would always make a good demo with CAT. And uh, if you take a look at this picture, right? Looks like a just regular cat, and if you almost over it, uh, you can probably see. But if you if you can if you can see the lower button, you can see it's actually pointing to a cat picture called cat.jpg. So if I click on the image, 
uh, when in the internet works is actually going to just show you the cat image.jpg JPG right here. So after after it loads. That's pretty much what the what the picture is. So looks pretty normal, right? I'm a user, I'm using the web page, and once I click on this, looks like a looks like a cat. So I just want to download the picture because I'll just like the cat. It's pretty cat. So if I drag it, take a look at this. If I drag it all the way to my file system and see it doesn't change anything. It's like look like a picture, right? Always look at a picture, look like a picture, look at the picture, still look at the picture. But if I double click on it, show the picture, but behind it, it shows something else. And because this one, if you take a look at it, it's not a picture, it is executable.exe. But user will not know this. And what, what is even better is because uh, in, in win on Windows, uh, hidden extension, uh, no extension are hidden by default, so people won't be able to see the .exe when they're seeing the file, similar to what they see here. And even if this turned off, you can still leverage something like right to left characters and to change how the text sequencing is arranged. So it can look like this um, file may look like a JPEG, but it's still a executable. So try search online, retro left characters. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that here. But you can see basically how it can fool user into thinking he was doing something, but he wasn't. And that was the second demo. As for recommendations, I would recommend browsers to warn user before letting them drag and drop anything out to their file system because this is where they cross the web and, and the local boundary. So and in the warning, I would recommend the browser vendor to show what the type of the file they're trying to download and also, if possible, which domain is downloading from. So that was illegal. I don't want to talk about that here. So the next thing I want to talk about is clipboard. So um, when I was doing the research, I was always trying to figure out, I was always curious, like, when you're going to a web page, is it going to steal anything from your clipboard or write anything to your clipboard? Because I, I usually copy paste some sensitive stuff, and if I go to the random web page, it's going to read anything from there, I'm definitely going to be worried. And the threat model I'm trying to consider is basically when you go to a malicious web page in your browser, can you guarantee your secret on a clipboard is never going to be written with their permission, which is the secrecy of the message? And can you guarantee the integrity of your message? So turns out that there are a few ways to do that. For example, um, some are specific, specific to different specific browsers. Some are, some are useful uh, and works across browsers. Uh, the first one that we're going to show you is basically uh, the clipboard um, window dot get and set data. So this is working IE only, and also it prompts user for permission. So it looks something like this: if you go to your IE, and if you go to the first page, say if you want to show, click on this button and show clipboard data, and it's going to prompt my permission. If I click on allow access. It's going to show uh, because I don't have anything. But let's say if I have something and I copy it, and now let me click on this button, it's going to show me clipboard data is something. And also, if I want to set it to something else, set it to black hat, set it, and show it again, it's going to be black hat. So basically, you can see uh, there using the Windows clipboard data to get set data, they are able to manipulate it, but it's only available if user approve it. So that's fine. What about something else? There's also an IE only feature, always IE, right? And it uses the object exact command. And a uh, user also will be prompted for doing any, allowing anything um, before the clipboard can be copied. So I'm gonna, not going to show a demo. It's going to be similar. But there are other things. For example, Flash. This is where things get interesting. Flash, you can read anything and write anything from and to clipboard without user permission at all. And Flash is enabled on every single browser as of today. And there's the last time I remember Firefox tried to disable it by default a year ago, 
uh, but they, they, they diverted to change because there's so many breakages or something like that. Um, but as of today, all browsers support Flash and it's enabled by default. So your clipboard is vulnerable at any moment when you visit any website. So if you take a look at the demo, uh, let's see here. I didn't write this demo, by the way. Um, but it's just, you can find a lot of things that like clipboard, uh, flash support, something like that on the internet. And here basically, uh, I want to type something called, uh, to copy my data. And if you click on copy, it's going to say my data is basically, they can see my data. And there's no browser prompt. And they can just read it and write it anything they want. So it's, it's pretty bad. I, I, and I think it's probably also available in other type of plugins. Uh, maybe um, um, those Microsoft plugins, I don't remember those names, Silverlight and something like that. So I think those probably are also available to get your clipboard content. So uh, just be aware, don't put anything there sensitive. And when you have that, just remove it later on. It's probably safe better. So uh, as a bonus point, let me show you something also quickly about how you can make some other deceptions to, to users. Something like when user, when they're trying to copy something from the internet and they think they copy something, but actually they copy something else. So let me just show you the demo right away and uh, instead of talking too, too much about it. So this is the page I want to show you. And what I want to do is basically I want to copy the copy me text. So I highlight it and click on control C copy. And when I click on here and do paste, I actually, it's not something I copied. So if you can't see, it's basically it says, well, you can't copy me. So it's basically from the message I was trying to copy. So what happened was that basically uh, in JavaScript, you can change the clipboard data or the things to be copied on the fly before it's being even, even copied into the clipboard. So when you just think they copy something, say they copy a command from step overflow or they copy a command, whatever, some other place to do, uh, say system ad admin tasks, they thought they copied some, something but when they paste it to the terminal, execute it, they're actually doing something else. So be careful when you're on the internet. It's just scary. Okay. So recommendations of browsers, uh, disable plugins by default. I can't stress this enough, um, but it's a hard sell. Um, there's a lot of vulnerabilities always happen to plugins and things like that. So it's better just safety disable them by default. And uh, also users respect browser warnings. They're not just stay there working for nothing. They're actually useful. And also trust but verify the content copy to your clipboard. And uh, after that, I want to pass it to Angelo to wrap it up. Thank you, Aaron. Already. Um, so let's do this. All right, so we're going to talk about um, login and history side channels. Now, what this is all about is uh, what, is, what is the difference between a login and a history stealing? Well, login detection basically means that we can detect if you're logged into a website, whereas history stealing means we can actually detect uh, what pages you visited. We can figure out exactly what domains you've been in, and then we can target attacks and tailor attacks to those domains. Um, now, back in 2006, uh, Jeremiah Grossman uh, figured out that you could actually steal history just observing the colors of the hyperlinks. Um, now, now, of course, that does not work anymore because um, browsers fixed it. The way they fixed it is they went ahead and they said, we're not going to allow you to read the computed style of any hyperlink. So if a hyperlink is purple uh, and you call window get computed style, you won't be able to read it. Uh, we will return you the same exact color, in this case blue. Now, the good news is um, you know, we have a long history of ignoring vulnerabilities that do not yield complete breaks. 
What that means is there's other ways to do it. For example, you could just look at the encrypted response size. We presented in Black Hat USA a breach and it's basically the same concept. Uh, or you could look at across the main ima image size. This is something that we wanted to show you here today in Black Hat Asia, which is uh, probably you haven't seen before. Um, so by default, images have a size of 28 by 30 pixels. So let's go to our demo page and I'll show you what I mean. Going to open Internet Explorer, evilhacker.com, demo3.html. Uh, you can see that the error page, the error size of a error image, is going to be 28 by 30. Now, 20 by 30 is the size of the X. All right? You've probably seen this X before. It happens when you fail to log in. Now, this is going to amaze you. I'm going to open in private browsing, okay? And I'm going to log in into my personal um, Salesforce account. Uh, this will work on any device. We just make him free publicity here for Salesforce. It will work against any website. Uh, so we're going to log into Salesforce um, eventually because the internet is super fast. Uh, maybe with the cable it will work better. All right. That wasn't me. Um, so we're going to log into Salesforce and look, just keep in mind that I have two different windows here. The first one is a regular browser and the second one, oh no, this is going to be bad. Okay. Um, it wants me to verify that I am indeed myself because I'm in Singapore and I should not be accessing my account. So just, just bear with me for a second. Um, see, this is what you don't do live demos because they never work. Um, but we are very brave um, and stupid. So we are going to make it work. Um, I, th I hope. Um, okay, I just got a code. Three seven two. No, next one. <laughs> Bingo. Okay, eight. Oh, you were close. Eight one seven eight two. Very very, very close. Um, all right, so we're gonna log in to Salesforce. Now keep in mind, I cannot stress this hard enough. This is a normal window right here on an evil hacker. This is Salesforce on in private mode. All right, so there are different domains. And, and in private mode is supposed to be private and after you close that window, nothing there, um, you know, should be there anymore. So what I'm going to do is something very reckless. I'm going to close this window in private and it's gone. All right. Now remember this X. You see it's very small. I'm going to refresh this page. Watch this. If it works, sometimes it works, what's the size? 200 by 236. This is unbelievable. It says logged in or was logged in. And the reason is the image size, even though the image cannot load, the image size has been cached by the browser even if you opened it in an in private window. So basically what the code is going to do is just going to check the, it's just going to try to load the image and the image is going to fail to load because I'm not authenticated. I was in an in private window. I closed the window. But the size of the image has been cached by the browser. Uh, don't ask me why. Well, I can actually tell you why. It's done for usability reasons, so images don't, don't overflow. Uh, but the, the image size is actually cache. So if the image size is 28, we know it's the default X. The image was not able to be loaded. Otherwise, we know it's a side channel, right? So otherwise, we, we know that you were logged in. So just because the image has this size, you know, this is the size of my picture and we can determine that you were logged in. So that's how we can tell that you use Salesforce and then we can try another attack against that service, right? Um, let's, let's look at the different side channel. Um, so if we, we can also look at event based image loading. So it basically um, it is a fixed URL that depending on whether it loads or it doesn't load, it will give you it will give you the answer of whether you're logged in or not, right? So let's let's look at how that um, how how would that lo look like really quickly. Um, so we're going to log in again, right? And it's going to let me load. Um, so once it loads, I'm going to run this new demo. Demo four. And it says all clear, right? It knows that I'm logged in because it has a event loader. So you can you can examine any image, for example, in this case is basically trying to load the default avatar picture, right? Like every internet service will have a default 
picture, like a default avatar. And if you're not logged in, that's going to prompt you to log in, so it's going to fail. So if I log out and I refresh the page, now it's going to tell me you're not logged in, right? Um, so it's another side channel that I can use to detect if you're logged into a web service or not. And, and there's finally one more, um, and we're going to talk about this one more. So another one is time, right? So let's say that there is a service that allows you to search for something, right? Um, it allows you to list all the files. Well, depend, you could load that cross domain using an image, using a style tag, using an embed, using an iframe, or using a script or even course, right? Uh, you could use a cross origin request even if you cannot read the response. It doesn't matter. You just need, you don't need to read the response. Same origin policy will not allow you to read the response. All you need to do is measure what is the time that it took for the response to come back to the browser cross domain. Uh, and you measure that basically by putting a timer on the on error event. Um, and you basically factor in the bandwidth and the round trip, what is the expected latency if you're not logged in and what's the expected latency if you're logged in and when that works, and it's going to take longer. So when it takes longer, you know that you're logged in. Um, so let's do. Uh, there's there's other other vectors, other side channels. Uh, you know, Michael Seleski presented this one, and I had a whole slide, but I think I'm just going to show you the demo if if it loads. Um, since my browser is too small, let's try it again. So it's a game. It's a fun game where you have all those asteroids that come to you, right? Now, it requires user interactions. So it's not as neat as the other things that I show you. Um, but what, what happens is these this, this asteroids are actually hyperlinks, you know, in, in the form of circles. Uh, and some of them are black, so you can't see them. Some of them are pink. The ones that are pink is because they have a CSS selector that says you visited them. So when you click the pink ones, right, the website knows, oh, you actually visited all the sites, Amazon, Twitter, CNN, Bank of America, eBay, and you did not visit all of this. So you're playing a game, right, and little do you know, the game is stealing information from you. So now the, the, the game knows that you, you bank at Bank of America and it can do other exploits against Bank of America, right? So just by interacting with the page. Uh, but of course it's a game you can't win because at the end you, you always lose. So, um, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a fair game. Um, I'm actually surviving for quite a while there. You're lucky. All right. Um, and there's one more thing that we wanted to show you today, uh, which is um, request animation frame. So there's also a JavaScript API that has been added recently that allows you to basically measure how fast a page or a canvas element is rendering. Uh, and what you do is basically you register a function and it's going to get a callback, right, with a timestamp every time there's a new frame that gets rendered uh, on the screen. So you can basically interpolate what is the frame rate of a website. You may think, well, that's not very useful, but it is because you can, you can selectively and purposely slow down links that were visited by, the, by you, right, uh, and by applying something that's going to make it slow, and I'll talk about that something in a moment, but what if you could selectively slow down certain links and then you could measure how long it takes to render it, right? Uh, so you could use something like CSS3 text shadow that allows you to use effects like drop shadows, glows, blur radius, etc. cetera. Um, and the DOM rendering time is going to be linearly proportional to how complex the CSS3 filters are. So the more complex the filters you apply, the more complex CSS animations, transformations, or globe, or whatever effects you apply, the longer it's going to take for the page to render those links. So you can apply all those effects to the links that were visited and not apply any effect to links that have not visited, right? Um, and then the timing is going to depend on, on how fast your computer is. But the idea is that, you know, if you need to make it as low enough to time, so in the order of milliseconds, right, uh, but fast enough so you can test a hundred websites, a hundred URLs per second. Um, and, and bonus points, and this is very interesting, is, you know, it turns out that when you use a mobile phone like Android or um, Chrome, I'm sorry, iOS, iPhone, um, the URL address bar for your search engine, it has a predefined template. So, and it's predictable. So you can not only figure out what pages you've been to, you can also figure out what search queries you have done, right? So um, what that means is, you know, let me, let me show you sort of what a 
predictable query looks like. Um, so if I search for the three of hearts, you know, the card, the three of hearts on iOS, it's going to go to google.com search, query equals three of hearts, and then it has some predefined parameters here, but all those parameters are going to be the same for everybody, right? So you can actually enumerate search queries and figure out if you search it or not. Uh, and I wanted to show you a demo on that, um, see if that worked. Um, so he, this is the demo we, we recorded this morning. Uh, so the quality is, um, you know, less than, less than stellar, but anyways, um, it's going to, um, you know, the quality is going to be better offline. So we'll just run the offline video. Um, so, oh, okay, one second, zoom the resolution um, video. Um, All right, full screen. That's it's. Hopefully, will work. Um, yeah, it, it works. Okay, so so we're searching for three of hearts, right? We're just searching for three of hearts, and then we're gonna go to malicious website, right? So three of hearts again. It did the query that I showed you before, which is a static query that's predictable, and then the next thing that it's going to do and we're going to wrap it up with this. It's going to go to evilhacker.com. Now evil hacker is testing every single combination, every single possible search query, every single possible card, and then eventually figures out that you visited the three of hearts. Um, if you want to test this later, you can, you can go in your mobile phone, you know, evilhacker.com, I actually own that domain, uh, forward slash magic. Uh, you can go to Google with the URL bar. It, it only works in the iPhone right now because that's what we, we have it set up. So you would search for three of hearts or f any card you want, like king of hearts, four of clubs, ace of spades, and then it's going to find out which card you search. It's going to discover it, right? Uh, and this also works in the desktop, um, and, and we'll close with this. You know, if you, if you open on the desktop, you can actually figure out which pages you visited. Um, here's, here's the same concept on Internet Explorer. Um, and what it's going to do is going to try to render the links. And like I said, the links that are using, the links that are using effects will actually take longer to render. Um, so that's why it's particularly interesting. But in, in my opinion, being able to figure out which search queries you've done is, is extremely valuable. Uh, and you can actually also do it partially because Google will do autocomplete for queries. So it will send requests for all of the intermediate queries. So you could potentially enumerate uh, a very interesting array of search terms. Um, so this is, you, you're going to see here that is able to measure the difference between rendering, you know, the links with the effects and the links without them because the, you can see there's an effect applied. There's this gray area over here. And then the ones that were visited uh, will, you know, will have a visited check next to it. And the ones that weren't, they won't. So I, I can tell which pages you visited before. Um, all right, so that's, um, that's what we talked about. That's um, pretty much um, everything we, uh, we have for you today. Um, so without further ado, we just wanted to thank you for being here and uh, here's our contact information if you want to uh, reach out to us and ask us any questions. Thank you. And uh, of course, if you enjoyed the talk, we, we would appreciate uh, any feedback in the feedback forums and uh, we'd like to open it for questions. Uh, this is some URLs from research that we've done in the past, if you're interested. Uh, breach attack and um, attackerdomain.com. Do we, do we have any question? All right, five seconds. No need to be so shy. Okay, one question. Yes. For, so all of the all of the demos that we have seen here are running on the latest version of IE, so Internet Explorer 11, and the latest version of Chrome. So, yep. All right, any other question? Uh, we'll be here. If you have any questions, please come up. Thank you again. Cheers.